We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is Burn, the Anadromist, and I'm coming to you on a kind of noisy, muggy day. It's not actually the weather's not too hot today. It's about 80 something degrees. It's been up almost near 100, so I'm pretty happy with it. But um, yeah, you will hear some off the distance. Uh, work. They're tearing down walls and putting up some sort of new building not far from here with big machinery. So if you hear that, hey, don't shoot me. So today we're going to continue with our discussion of time. Um, I've already explained why time and memory became so important to me. And I've explained how I feel like it's, it's a principle that it should be really important to us, the idea of living within time. And yet, how many of us do live within time? Last time I discussed how we live in a culture that is essentially hostile to time, is absolutely antagonistic to the idea of living within time. So we've created things to make everything go faster, to connect us uh, across the world, uh, to slow down our experiences or speed them up with drugs or to put us in a perpetual wow like both uh, some drugs and our, our technology does to us to give us the illusion that we're learning so much when in fact we are not because you can't learn things quickly. You have to take time. Uh, quick learning is essential superficial learning and superficial learning wears off. So, but... One of the problems is, is that I didn't define what I was talking about uh, with time, and that's what I'm going to start to do today. This is only going to be one aspect of what time is. And the first thing I want to tell you is, whatever else time is, it is not the clock. That's really important. It is not the clock. Clocks are only a measurement of time, a visual reduction of duration. You know, we have an hour going around, or, or is it this way? Let's see. Uh, yeah, an hour going around. I want to make sure I'm getting it right, not going counterclockwise. But why does that matter? Well, it does matter. But, uh, but the point is, is that it's just an hour. And this idea that the clock is time is pretty much at the root of our misconceptions about time. People will often say that time has gone crazy in our, our age. No, it hasn't. It's our relationship to clocks that has gone crazy. And behind that, the schedule. But we'll get to that eventually. Uh, the clock tempts us to think of time as a universal object, that everyone has the same time. And I can tell you, living in Georgia, everyone does not have the same time. Um, but we say things like, where did the time go? You know, we're losing time. We're running out of time. Well, what we're doing is we're looking at a clock, watching it go around, and we're saying, uh, yeah, there are less of those little minute things going around than there were a while ago. But that's not time. Time isn't that measurement of duration. Time is what happens inside that measurement of duration. Whatever else time is, time is personal. Which also means that each person experiences time differently. What do I mean? How do we experience time? I mentioned this before uh, in the first discussion, but I'll mention it again. Uh, I'll just use this example. Take three people. Let's contrast their experience of time. The first is has just fallen in love. And for them, an hour goes by too quickly. Wonderfully, but too quickly. They can't wait to see the person again. But even when they're with the person, it seems to just go by too quickly. If wonderfully, meaningfully, but too quickly. 
The second person is working at a, they're just having another forgettable day at a, a you know, repetitious job. You know, you see this often with employees uh, who are waiting on you at a store or someplace. I see this all the time in Georgia. Someone's just sitting there waiting for something to happen. The day is just boring. But, or it's just really busy. But whatever it is, the point is, the work, being repetitious, is forgettable. And what that means is when you look back at this day, say, what did you do for your job on October 21st, 2017? Who knows? I mean, I, I can try to say to myself, what well, get close to what I was doing on that day. I can use my memory to do that. But then again, I can guarantee you I was not working at a repetitious job on that day. Uh, in fact, I was uh, in Europe on that day, uh, working on my Gravity from Above documentary. Um, but the point is, if you can't remember it because it all disappears into the same thing, did it even happen? What was that hour about? Anything? So, that's the second person. The third person has just lost a loved one. Their mother, their father, their child, a, you know, their brother, their sister, a very close friend, somebody very close has died. And their experience of that hour is going to be slow and difficult and painful. The closer the person, the more painful and slow the hour. Uh, it'll be like getting stuck in time. You wish it would pass, and yet there's nothing you can do to make it go quicker. Just the opposite of falling in love. And there are many, many other states of time. Too many to list, because the point is, everyone experiences time differently. But not only everyone, every animal experiences time differently. Every dog experiences time a bit differently. Every uh, tree experiences time differently. They're not conscious, but nevertheless, they are inhabiting time. For instance, two trees are next to each other. One is got good soil. The other one, not so good soil. They're experiencing things differently. They're in a different state of time. Every atomic and subatomic particle is experiencing time differently, is moving differently. Every star is moving differently. There are no two things that experience time the same way. That's really crucial. Nevertheless, we all do have experiences where, for instance, if you put a person into certain environments, they will experience certain kinds of aspects of time uh, in a similar way. It's just they will also experience it in a personal way. So, new time. New time is really interesting. You experience new time, for instance, when you're traveling. And it's the first time you arrive in, say, Paris or Hong Kong. And suddenly you look at everything and you're not from Paris or Hong Kong. And, and, and everything to you is totally different. It's totally different than you imagine. And so you're putting all this new information into your head. And you look and you say, oh, my goodness, there's a person playing, a, you know, an accordion in a metro. How French. You know, or you're in Hong Kong and you see, you know, odd objects hanging from stalls that are look cooked and such. You go like, what is that? And hopefully it's not a dog. <laughs> that would be maybe Shanghai. But, you know, the point is this. Everything is experience. You're experiencing it radically differently. And so it tends to make new time tends to be dense, rich time that you remember really clearly. And, of course, it's not just for travel. It could be going over to someone's house that you've never been to before or meeting people that you've never known before, being uh, in a situation you've never been before, or the first day in a new job. You tend to remember these things. Um, then there's creative time. Creative time is time that disappears when you are consumed by a creative endeavor. And what's interesting about that, now, I, I both paint sometimes and... I write. Now, I can tell you very clearly, these are two very different kinds of experiences of time. The writing time is much more difficult than the painting time. Writing time can be like work. Really, really, really interesting work. But work nonetheless. But painting time is more like therapy. Especially if you're not under the gun to produce something for a certain moment. Uh, which is what makes it difficult for artists who really have to produce for a show because it's like, you know, go to therapy now, you know. Um, 
So, but creative time is time that just disappears. But it's wonderful time. A bit like falling in love. Um, then there's game time. And game time and sports time and gambling time and video game time and monopoly time are all very different kinds of time. But the point is, every game has a different time. But games are almost, it's almost obsessive time. And you get lost in the game. And, and I've come to think about it as getting lost in patterns. And what is it about these patterns that so entice us? and cause us to lose ourselves within them. For instance, a person who is gambling, you may say, and especially an addict, you may say that the gambling addict is, you know, obsessed with winning money. No, they're not. Because I'll tell you the truth, sometimes they win big. That doesn't stop them from going and losing the rest of it. Why? There's something in the patterns. I think you see this with video games as well. There are people who just simply disappear into the patterns. They have to, you know, do something with these patterns. And, of course, there are questions of what is the meaning of these patterns. I'm not even going to begin to address that here because it's too complicated at this moment. But what about dream time? Dream time is really odd. Was that dream only five minutes long or five years? You know, we've had that experience, most of us, I think, where... It just seems like days have gone by in the dream, but you just fell asleep after waking up and you, you were only asleep for like a half hour, but it feels like, wow, how long that was. What is dream time? And then there's the, the time that children experience, child time. And this is really strange because it's completely different from the time that adults experience. Um, for one thing, I think it involves a lot of new time. Uh, there's a lot of things that are new. But also it involves time that's strangely painful to the child at, at moments and then suddenly isn't. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, if you've been around little children at all, you'll know that suddenly a moment can be terrifying. You know, uh, uh, cutting themselves on a piece of glass or a bee sting or, or just even a loud noise. And then five minutes later, they're laughing and giggling. <laughs> you know, what kind of time relationship is that? And I'm sure if you've had any children or been around children for any length of time, you recognize their experience of time is different. I have one friend um, uh, who's a neuroscientist, and his feeling was that children experience time that, you know, a five-year-old child has only been alive for five years. And so for them, what what to us seems like, you know, this is why children have difficulty waiting. What to us seems like, okay, you're going to have to wait for that tomorrow, is a much larger chunk of their time, because they've only been alive for five years, than, say, and, you know, I'm 64 years old, than saying to me, you have to wait for like a day. For me, a day is like, jeepers, that's almost here. And of course, then there's that question about the way older folks experience time. And the general consensus that most people seem to share is that time goes by much quicker when you're older. You know, I thought about that when I first came up with these ideas about time. And I thought to myself, well, maybe that's because older folks aren't experiencing enough new time. They've settled into patterns. Their lives have become like the McDonald's worker who's like doing the same job over and over. So how do you uh, get around that? Well, as T.S. Eliot said, maybe old men should become explorers. You know, here I am in Georgia. I don't consider myself particularly old, but I'm not particularly young. In the past, I would have been old, but now I'm not. Well, what is that about? Why is it people today experience time differently than people did 100 years ago? That, uh, you know, there are still places in Africa where the average male adult lives to be like 40 years old. Hmm. All of those are relationships in time. But the point is, my life doesn't feel like it's moving quickly uh, my years are full. Why? I realized this a long time ago. The secret is living within time. And that means having a variety of times. Oh, and then there is sick time. Sick time doesn't just get slow. It gets weird. And that also depends on the type of sickness and, of course, your personal relationship to the sickness. So, you know... An hour with even just a head cold, an hour with a fever, is a very different thing. I had a fever, uh, what was it, three years ago. 
while I was in Europe, that was just, I mean, it's like everything went to a slow crawl as I walked home. And I got there and the key from under the door, I was actually in, in Lyon, France, the key from under the door that I was supposed to use to open the door wasn't there. And I just stopped and sat on the step. And I don't know how long passed. Eventually someone came. I think it was about 20 minutes. It seemed like about 20 hours. It didn't matter anymore. It wasn't that it was slow. It was just strange. I just thought, like, how long can I be here? My head was just burning up. Sick time is strange. Um, the point is this. Clocks measure the same duration for everyone. But time is not the visual passing of the clock, but the personal experience lived within the clock. And the point is this, time for everything is like that. It isn't time, the passing of time isn't simply what happens in an hour, though that's very useful for, you know, scientific measurements, and I have nothing against those things. But the point is this, time is what happens inside that hour. The hour is just our measurement. It's our visualization, really, of time. But time isn't that. Time is something else. Obviously, clocks have a value. I don't mean to imply that we should throw our clocks out. Um, but in our society, we are often slaves to the clock, or more precisely, slaves to the schedule. And the schedule is the technique, to use Jacques Ellul's term, that essentially binds us to the clock as a mechanism. And it is the schedule. If you really think about it, it is the schedule behind all the terrors of, of our disordered sense of time with regards to work and, and doing what we have to do. So think of the alarm clock. It's that schedule that says I have to be at work on time. It's our relationship to the schedule. And the schedule is a really problematic thing. Or consider the work clock, the clock at work, and how people look at it, you know. And whether it's the employee waiting for just the right moment to leave. And in some, you know, companies, it's like if you leave a minute early, you're a bad employee. And in other companies, it's like you're done. Go, it's okay. You'll get paid the same. Um... But also, it's, it's the fact that we are measured, we're paid for our time in so many jobs by the hour, which is really weird. So, you may not be doing anything, but you're going to pad your hour just to get the extra, you know, 10, 15, 350 an hour, whatever you're getting an hour. You're going to, you're going to, it's very strange. The clock keeps everything running on time. And if you've ever been to Switzerland, you know that's really true. I've never been to a place where the clock keeps everything running on time and the schedule. So, for instance, here, here's what's fascinating. I was in uh, France. Uh, it was about three years ago, the same trip. Uh, I was going from Lyon, and my next uh, stop was to get to uh, uh, near uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. So all I had to do, I was down in near that area in France, all I had to do was take the French trains and get to the Swiss border. It wasn't that far. It took me over 12 hours. I think it was much longer than that. Even. No, it was longer than that. It was about 15, 16 hours to do it. Why? Because the French are terrible at keeping time and following schedules. And all, I remember I was about uh, three kilometers away from the border, stuck at a French uh, a station, just waiting for a, a French train to get me over the border. Because I knew as soon as I got over the border in Switzerland, everything would work again. And I get over the border in Switzerland. And um, as soon as I got there, I was about... Uh, I, you know, I, I knew I'd missed certain things that I wanted to do. Uh, I was, it was like almost 10 o'clock at night. I had to get to the last bus in this little town uh, to get, go up the mountain to, towards the uh, Swiss ski town of Villar. I was on my way to Waymo in Switzerland to go to Libri. And 
Uh, but I knew as soon as I got over the Swiss border, everything would work. In France, they don't know what track the train is going to be on like an hour ahead of time. They won't tell you if they do know. It's like a secret. But when you get to Switzerland, there's a little schedule there. And, and, and oh, what a glorious schedule it is. For all my complaining about schedules, Swiss schedules are absolutely amazing. Written a year ahead of time telling you what track your train will be on. You go there, you wait. And I said to myself, now the train was due to leave at uh, two minutes after, like, uh, it was like, uh, what was it? 9.52. The ten train was, was scheduled to leave at 9.52. And I said to myself, it will arrive at 9.49. And we'll leave at 10.52. Uh, 9.52. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Actually, I think it was 10.52. No, it was 9.52. It was right near 10. So, I, you know, it was just absolutely on time. Now that's, when you see schedules like that, you say, wow, that's impressive. But then again, think about Switzerland. It's kind of a boring place. <laughs> and Switzerland definitely runs completely on the clock time, which isn't bad. But the point is this, is that clock time, uh, you know, it's like, can you imagine even living without a clock? Can you imagine living without it? And yet, millions upon millions upon millions of people have lived without clocks all throughout history. And there are people, probably people today, living without clocks in all sorts of places in the world, or for whom clocks are not too important. So, we're going to leave it there. I just wanted to talk about time being personal, not being the clock. The clock is only a measurement of time. When you put it in that, in that framework... The clock, even the schedule, can be useful. But when you start thinking that the clock is time, and that time, you know, we're wasting time as we talk, or as we do things that aren't, you know, valuable according to the schedule, then you start getting into the problematic relationship with time. So, well, uh, please do... Smite that like button down below and uh, make a comment if you've got any thoughts. Share this video. Um, I'm trying to build the numbers up. It would be helpful. Share the video uh, if you think this is valuable information about time and about how we live in this world. And, uh, and consider becoming a paying subscriber in order to get extra content. Uh, I've already sent off about seven hours worth of material. More will be coming. Um, I just sent off my San Francisco in the 60s series. And if you become a paid subscriber, you'll get to have my whole like long breakdown. There's three lectures that I did on San Francisco in the, in the uh, 60s. And I did that at Libre. This is just an audio lecture, but you get the full musical examples and such as well. So, um, but yeah, someone actually just contributed about $125 uh, uh, today, actually. And what's interesting about that is that that amount pays for my food for a month here. Pretty amazing. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's all my food budget for the month. That really helps me because it's, uh, you know, I do have financial things I am thinking about. And I need to take time to do these videos. Uh, these videos just don't occur in a vacuum. Um, there's a lot that goes into all of this and I'd like to do more. So the more you contribute, the more freedom I have to do these things. But, you know, it's not really about the money. Uh, it's really about the conversation. And so if you feel like getting in touch, um, you can go to my Anadromous Life page on, uh, Facebook or you can also check out my Anadromous Life, um, essay site, which is through WordPress. And uh, I've, if you get really interested in what I'm doing with puppets and such, there is uh, my puppet documentary, also more thoughts about art. Go to my Gravity From Above uh, page as well. The links are below. There's lots more that, that there is to say, of course, always. But the main thing is, is I just want to thank everyone who's watching this. I can't do this without you. And... Uh, even though I don't have thousands upon thousands of subscribers yet, not that I, not that I care. If you get too many people, then you, 
that you can't really communicate the way you can now. So now if you get in and you're listening and you want to talk, I'm here for you. You know, if I get 10,000 subscribers, that's going to be a lot tougher to get a uh, personal dialogue going. So consider that when you're thinking about uh, subscribing and such. Anyway, um, yeah, anadromous. It's a word that means going against the stream, like salmon do when they swim upriver to go spawn. Uh, to me, it's about living in such a way that, that doesn't just float downstream. Uh, you know, dead log floats downstream. But if you swim upstream, then you're living the anadromous life. Think about it. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.